Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 40 Motives for Assisting the Holy Souls Obligation not only of charity, but also of justice We have just considered devotion to the holy souls in purgatory as a work of charity. Prayer for the dead, we have said, is a holy work, because it is a very solitary exercise of that most excellent of virtues, charity. This charity towards the departed is not only optional and of counsel, but it is also a precept no less than to give alms to the poor, as there exists a general obligation of charity for almsgiving. With how much greater reason are we not bound by the general law of charity to assist our suffering brethren in purgatory? This obligation of charity is often joined to an obligation of strict justice. When a dying person, either by word or mouth, or by written testament, expresses his last wishes in regard to works of piety, when he charges his heirs to have a certain number of masses celebrated, to distribute certain sums of alms for any good work whatsoever, the heirs are obliged to strict justice from the very moment they came into possession of the property to fulfill without delay the last wishes of the deceased. This duty of justice is the more sacred as these pious legacies are frequently but disguised restitutions. Now, what does a daily experience teach us? Do people hasten with religious exactitude to acquit themselves of these pious obligations which concern the souls of the departed? Alas, quite the contrary. A family which comes into possession of a considerable fortune doles out to the poor departed relative the few suffrages that he reserved for his own spiritual benefit, and if the subsidies of the civil law favors them, the members of the family are not ashamed under the pretext of some informality or fraudulently set aside the will in order to rid themselves of the obligation of making those pious legacies. It is not in vain that the author of the imitation counsels us to make satisfaction for our sins during our life and not to depend too much upon our heirs, who often neglect to exact the pious endowments made by us for the relief of our poor souls. Let such familiarities beware. This is sacrilegious injustice combined with an atrocious cruelty. To steal from the poor person, says the fourth council of Carthage, is to become his murderer. What then shall we say of those who rob the dead, who unjustly deprive them of the suffrages, and leave them without assistance in the terrible torments of purgatory? Moreover, those who render themselves guilty of this infamous theft are frequently most severely punished by God even in this life. We are sometimes astonished to see a considerable fortune melt away, as it were, in the hands of a certain heirs. A sort of maldiction seems to hover over their inheritances. In the day of judgment, when that which is now hidden shall be made manifest, we shall see the cause of this ruin has frequently been the avarice and injustice of the heirs, who neglected the obligations opposed upon them in regard to pious bequests when they succeeded the property. It happened in Milan, says Father Rossangioli, that a magnificent estate, situated a short distance from the city, was completely devastated by hail. Whilst the neighboring fields remained uninjured, this phenomenon attracted attention and astonishment. It reminded one of the plagues of Egypt. The hail ravaged the field of the Egyptians and respected the land of Gesson, inhabited by the children of Israel. This was looked upon as a similar scourge. The mysterious hail could not have confined itself exclusively within the limits of one property without obeying an intelligent cause. People knew not how to explain this phenomenon. When an apparition of a soul from the purgatory revealed that it was a chastisement inflicted upon ungrateful and culpable children, who had neglected to execute the last will of their departed father relative to certain works of piety, 
We know that in all countries, in all places, there are spoken of haunted houses rendered uninhabitable to the great loss of their proprietors. Now, if they try to fathom the cause of this, we shall generally find that a soul forgotten by his relatives returns to claim the suffrages justly due to it. Whether it be attributed to credulity, or to the excitement of imagination, to hallucination, or even to deception, it will ever remain a well-proven fact to teach unfailing heirs how God punishes such unjust and sacrilegious conduct even in this life. The following incident, which we borrow from Thomas of Contemporary, proves clearly how culpable in the sight of God are those heirs who defraud the dead. During the wars of Charlemagne, a vigilant soldier had served in the most important and honorable positions. His life was that of a true Christian. Content with his pay, he refrained from every act of violence, and the tumult of the camp ever prevented him from his fulfillment of his essential duties, although in matters of minor importance he had been guilty of many little faults common to men of his profession. Having reached a very advanced age, he fell ill, and seeing that his last hour had come, he called to his bedside an orphan nephew, and to whom he had been a father, and expressed to him his dying wishes. My son, he said, you know that I have no riches to bequeath to you. I have nothing but my weapons and my horse. My weapons are few, as to my horse, sell it when I shall have rendered my soul to God, and distribute the money among the priest and the poor, that the former may offer the holy sacrifice for me, and the others may assist me at their prayers. The nephew wept, and promised to execute without delay the last wishes of his uncle and benefactor. The old man had dying soon after. The nephew took possession of the weapons and led away the horse. It was a very beautiful and valuable animal. Instead of selling it immediately, as he had promised his deceased uncle, he began using it for short journeys, and as he is well pleased with it, he did not wish to part with it so soon. He deferred under the double pretext that there was nothing that urged the prompt fulfillment of the promise, and that he would wait a favorable opportunity to obtain a high price for him. Thus delaying from day to day, from week to week, and from month to month, he ended by stifling the voice of his conscience, and forgot the sacred obligation which he had towards the soul of his benefactor. Six months had elapsed, when one morning the deceased appeared to him, addressing him in terms of severe reproach. Unhappy man, he said, thou hast forgotten the soul of thy uncle. Thou hast violated the sacred promise which thou didst make at my deathbed. Where are the masses which thou oughtest to have had offered? Where are the alms which thou shouldest had it distributed to the poor for the repose of my soul? Because of thy guilty negligence, I have suffered unheard of torments in purgatory. Finally, God had taken pity on me. Today I am enjoying the company of the blessed in heaven. But thou, by a just judgment of God, shall die in a few days, and be subjected to the same tortures which would have remained for me to endure had not God shown mercy to me. Thou shalt suffer for the same length of time that I should have suffered after which thou shalt commence the expiation of thy own faults. A few days later, the nephew fell dangerously ill. He immediately called a priest, related to him the vision, and confessed his sins. Weeping bitterly, I shall die soon, he said, and I accept death from the hands of God as a chastisement which I have but too well merited. He expired in the sentiments of humble repentance. This was but the least part of the sufferings which had been announced to him in punishment of his injustice. We tremble with horror at the thought of the remaining portion which he was about to undergo in the other life. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 41, Motives of Justice 
St. Bernadine relates that a married couple, having no children, made a contract that in case one should die before the other, the one who survived was to distribute the property left by the other for the repose of the soul of the deceased. The husband died first, and his widow neglected to fulfill her promise. The mother of the widow was still living, and the deceased appeared to her, begging her to go to her daughter and urge in her her in the name of God to fulfill her engagement. If she delays, he said, to distribute, distribute in alms the sum which I have destined for the poor, tell her on the part of God that in thirty days she will be struck by a sudden death. When the impious widow heard this solemn warning, she had the audacity to treat it as a dream and persisted in her sacrilegious infidelity to her promise. Thirty days passed, and the unfortunate woman, having gone to an upper room in the house, fell through the window and was killed on the spot. In Justice Towards the Dead, of which we have just spoken, and fraudulent maneuvers to escape the obligation of executing their pious legacies are grievous sins, crimes which merit the eternal punishment of hell. Unless a sincere confession and at the same time due restitution is made, this sin will meet its chastisement not in purgatory but in hell. Alas, yes, it is especially in the other life that divine justice will punish the guilty us usurpers of the property of the dead. Judgment without mercy to him that hath not done mercy, says the Holy Ghost in James 2.13. If these words be true, how rigorous a judgment awaits those whose detestable avarice has left the soul of a parent a benefactor for months, years, perhaps even for centuries, in the frightful torments of purgatory. This crime, as we have said before, is the, is the most grievous because in many cases these sufferings which the deceased asked for his soul are but disguised restitutions. This fact is, in some families, but too often overlooked. People find it very inconvenient to speak of intrigue and clerical avarice. The finest pretexts are made use of to invalidate a lost will and testament, which often, perhaps in the majority of cases, involves a necessary restitution. The priest is but a medium in this indispensable act, bound to absolute secrecy by virtue of his sacramental ministry. Let us explain this more clearly. A dying man has been guilty of some injustice during his life. This is of a more frequent occurrence than we imagine even in regard to men who are most upright in the eyes of the world. At the moment when he is about to appear before God, his, this sinner makes his confession. He wishes to make a full reparation, as he is bound to do, of all the injury which he has caused his neighbor, but he has not the time left to do so himself and is not willing to reveal the sad secret to his children. What does he do? He covers his restitution under the veil of a pious legacy. Now, if this legacy is not paid, and consequently the injustice not repaired, what will become of the soul of the deceased? Will it be detained for an indefinite length of time in purgatory? We know not all the laws of divine justice, but numerous apparitions serve to give us some idea of them, since they all declare that they cannot be admitted into eternal beatitude, so long as any part of the debt of justice remains to be cancelled. 
Moreover, are not these souls culpable for having deferred until their death the payment of a debt of justice which they had owed for so long a time? And if their heirs neglect to discharge it for them, is it not a deplorable consequence of their own sin, of their own guilt, guilty delay? It is through their fault that these ill-gotten goods remain in the family, and they will not cease to cry out against them as long as restitution be not made. Property cries out for its lawful owner. It cries out against its unjust possessor. If through the malice of the heirs, restitution is never made, it is evident that it, that soul cannot remain in purgatory forever. But in this case, a long delay to his entrance into heaven seems to be a fitting chastisement for an act of injustice, which the soul has retracted it is true, but which still abides in its efficacious cause. Let us therefore think of these grave consequences when we allow days, weeks, months, and perhaps even years to elapse before discharging so sacred a debt. Alas, how feeble is our faith! If a domestic animal, a little dog, falls into the fire, do you delay to draw it out? And see your parents, benefactors, persons most dear to you, rise in the flames of purgatory, and you do not consider it your urgent duty to relieve them. You delay, you allow long days of suffering to pass for those poor souls, without making an effort to perform those good works which will release them from their pains.